Greetings all, this is Harry Nick. How are you guys going? We finally get a chance to take a look at the early days of the X-Wing 2nd Edition meta. We have some major tournament results, or at least we have kind of major tournament results. What I'm talking about is the Coruscant Invitational that took place over the last week in America. And this was an interesting tournament because it was kind of this introductory tournament to X-Wing 2nd Edition with a bit of a twist on it. And unfortunately that twist while cool and interesting and made for a fun tournament, does sort of taint its uh, perception of the meta as a whole. It means we don't really get a full clear picture. What I'm talking about are these articles that FFG put out a couple of months ago, talking about the three different factions and featuring a few upgrade cards specific to those factions. In these articles, they encouraged us to vote on specific upgrade cards that must be flown in each of these three factions in the Coruscant Invitational. In other words, if you flew a Rebel list, you must fly whatever it is people voted on that must be in every single Rebel list. The cards that were selected to be required for each of the three factions was Ruthless on the Empire, Leia Organa on the Rebellion, and the Boba Fett crew card on the Scum and Villainy faction. Now these were all upgrade cards, there were no pilots, so Boba Fett was only in crew. And this had an interesting effect on everything. Apart from anything else, uh, these were also free. You'd still have the same bid you had if you didn't have these cards, and it meant you could have a list that would otherwise be more than 200 points. This has an interesting effect because depending on the upgrade slot it takes up, depending on the cost of the card, um, that can add something very powerful to your list. In the case of the Rebellion with Leia Organa, they had a free eight point card, which is not insignificant. However, it should also be said that uh, the Rebellion and the Scum faction, I feel were particularly hamstrung in terms of meta play because they had to fly a ship with a crew slot. And that does have some limitation list building wise. Also, particularly for the Scum faction, this was quite brutal because having the Boba Fett crew card meant that no Scum player in this tournament could fly the Boba Fett pilot card. And the Boba Fett pilot card on the Fire Spray is seriously, seriously making waves in the early days of the second edition meta. And that somewhat skews the results of this tournament. It's a bit hard to say, well, if Scum don't have access to one of their best pilots, is it really fair to suggest that these lists that we're seeing here are indications of meta Scum lists? in the early days of second edition might not be. Um, also, in the case of Imperials, Ruthless, what we've found with second edition list building is the talent is not the coveted upgrade slot that it used to be. We don't have a veteran instincts, push the limits, expertise. Uh, we have Predator and Lone Wolf, but they're not nearly as powerful as they used to be. Um, nothing is really required in the talent slot. And considering they were able to field this for free, I felt like out of all the factions, the Empire were definitely the least hamstrung. Indeed, if we have a look at the top 16, the Empire by far had the most lists. And I don't want to sound too cynical here, but I feel like the required cards that were put into these lists were often just done because they had to go there, but really had no overall impact on the list building and the way they were flown. As a result, because the Empire had the least restrictive upgrade, I feel very much that this had the least negative effect on one faction. And as a result, they overperformed. Now, this is not to say the Empire isn't the go-to faction in second edition. It still might be. My early perception of how the Empire is performing is quite high. I think they're actually really legitimate. Um, they're just as efficient as they always used to be moving towards the end of first edition, but they don't have a lot of the problems that kept them out of serious meta play. Um, bombing, alpha strikes, all that kind of stuff, which really hurt the Empire, just doesn't seem to be as oppressive anymore, which is really good for the faction. So in this video, we're going to take a look at all the top eight lists. But before we do, I just want to talk about a few anomalies from the top 16 overall. There were, for example, only three rebel lists and all of them had X-Wings. Favoring the high initiative pilot in Luke Skywalker and Wedge Antilles. This is no surprise. Um, I spoke about these ships just recently. I think they're a great all-round toolbox kind of ship. And if the Empire is going to be as powerful as they are moving forward, it means having these high initiative toolbox ships that can take it to aces, but still function well against swarms and brawlers and control and all that kind of stuff, 
does seem like a very positive thing. Also, apart from these guys, we saw quite a few lists featuring Sabine Wren on the attack shuttle. Now, Sabine Wren didn't make it in the top eight of this tournament, but I absolutely will be talking about this part in future videos. She's doing very well. Um, the main reason for that is she just interacts really well with linked actions, and it seems to be a byproduct of the design moving forward, and just seems to be a really legitimate card. Might be due for a points increase when that rolls around. We had a total of five scum lists. Now, all of these bar one had three ships in them. The one that didn't was a bunch of generic ships and Drea Renthal. We'll talk about that when we get to the top eight. But what's interesting is all the rest of them featured Fenrau and Palob Goldali. So these guys seem to be performing quite well. Out of the rest of them, uh, two of them featured Guri, one of the other ones featured Forlom, and the other one, apart from that, featured Old Terok. And this seems to be pretty indicative of where the Scum faction's at. It seems to have a lot of really good pilots. Now, I will say, um, this does seem to indicate that Palob Goldali is performing quite well. But remember, the Scum had to field at least one ship that had a crew slot. So just because Palob is perhaps the best option that has a crew slot doesn't necessarily mean he's one of the best scum pilots. That's what I mean by the Kurasan Invitational not being entirely clear on meta play. However, there is a good chance that Paylob will see a lot of play. He did perform reasonably well in first edition and the platforms had a very nice push. That ability is still very, very relevant. And also before I move on, yes, I know I was very down on the Fang Fighter when we got all those points revealed. However, early days does seem to suggest that Fen Rao's doing quite well. Maybe alongside Guri, we have a legitimate ace build with the scum faction that could be very interesting hopefully we see a bit more about that and i can report a bit more on that but yes by a large margin the faction that performed best was the empire we saw a lot of sun tears a lot of vaders a lot of whisper but the pilot that saw the most play was absolutely red line on the Thai punisher which is very, very interesting. Um, I'm trying to assess exactly why this is. Apart from anything, yes, the frames had a very nice push. The Punisher just seems to be in a good pace, um, power level-wise and points-wise. But I think it, what it comes down to is Redline's ability. It just seems to be very good and versatile. The fact that he can take locks very effectively, he can take two locks at once, or boost lock and focus lock and all that kind of stuff. It all seems to be very versatile enough. And the fact that he can fly alongside two aces have sort of like a quasi light alpha strike strategy alongside two aces. The winning list used this archetype and it's no surprise. It just seems like Redline's in a great place with both his ability and the Punisher frame having a nice push. But enough about that, let's move on to the top eight. Now we're gonna go from eighth place to first and talk about each of these lists. First up, we have a list that features Darth Vader on the TIE Advanced and Rex LeBrath on the TIE Defender. Vader has Supernatural Reflexes, Fire Control, and Afterburners. Rex LeBrath has the prerequisite Ruthless, Advanced Sensors, and Heavy Laser Cannon. And this is cool to see. Um, I'm very curious about two ship builds that feature Defenders. Not only just Defenders, but as we saw here, we have a Supernatural Vader. Supernatural Vader is something I was skeptical of to begin with, but it seems to be doing quite well. The downside with Supernatural Reflexes is if Vader wants to boost, he must damage himself, but if he can fly aggressively enough, that seems okay. Plus, he's got Afterburner, so he does have the agency to do a boost sometimes when he's not using Supernatural Reflexes. But I guess in a pinch, he still can, and that's flexibility. Flexibility is always a good thing, and being able to do a barrel roll before he moves as opposed to after... Seems pretty legit, and it seems to be performing quite well. Also, I like the idea of advanced sensors and heavy laser cannon on Rex Brath. Not always the easiest thing to line up, but when you can boost or barrel roll before you move, you have a lot more agency to get Rex Brath in just the right spot. And I think this list overall is based on versatility and making sure it's firing at all cylinders, which seems like a good concept. Not a list for the faint-hearted, but a cool idea nonetheless. Moving on to a dedicated Imperial Alpha Strike list with Captain Jonas, Skimitar Squadron Pilot, Redline, and Death Rain. Lots of really, really cool stuff going on here. Bombers and Punishers using their points reduction to get an effective Alpha Strike and bombing on the table for a pretty good rate. Captain Jonas being the new sort of how runner for missiles and torpedoes, Seems like a really fun thing to try and build around, and this flying in formation is going to do a lot of damage early on. I've spoken about this before, I'm pretty convinced that Imperial Alpha Strike is going to be a serious archetype moving forward. And this just goes to show you can get one generic and three named pilots with relative abilities, a decent amount of bombs, uh, Death Rain just flinging out stuff when he explodes, Redline with that ultra efficiency, and Captain Jonas just getting re-rolls on all your attack dice, it feels really, really powerful. I'm really keen to see this one on the table. 
Now, moving on, we have this generic plus Dre Renthal list, and this is something very interesting. It's an archetype in the Scum Faction I've wanted to have a serious look at. Dre Renthal and Calf Scarlet are both sort of pirate queens that care about generic ships flying alongside them. Drea Renthal, in my opinion, is the one that needs a serious look at because it seems like a lot of upside, but very high ceiling to get rerolls on all your generic ships potentially in one turn. And what's going on here? She's been flown alongside five generics, plus L337 on the escape craft is a bit of upside as well. Woody Harrelson in this list is interesting as well because we get to replace a rock. Being able to replace the rock could prove very potent when we're talking about flying in formation. Getting those Jakku Gunrunners and Binyari Pirates to fly all together, potentially all getting re-rolls, um, repositioning with tractor tokens, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, I dig it. The quad jumper is in a very cool place right now. Um, we're actually going to talk about it on the next hangar bay. It just seems to be really effective and cheap. Um, the Binyari Pirate, 24 points, seems pretty legitimate as well. Now, we haven't really utilized the Binyari Pirate. There's no elicits on it, so we don't really um, get the full value out of that 24 points, but... That's fine. Flying this means we're able to fit everything in points wise. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to get five generics alongside Drea Renthal. So it makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like three Jakku Gunrunners and two downgraded Jakku Gunrunners, if you could say. Now, moving on to the only ace scum list to make it into the top eight, we have Fenrau, Guri, and Paylob. One of these many sort of cut and paste three of scum lists I was talking about before. And this is really interesting because we see a lot of Fen Rao's that just don't have any upgrades on him. The reason I'm very curious about this is because we're seeing a lot of Sun Tefel. Um, in fact, we saw a lot of Sun Tefel with basically no upgrades on him. Sun Tefel is 16 points cheaper and in terms of power level is not significantly different. I think the only clear thing you can point at at Sun Tefel and Fen Rao is the fact that Fen Rao has one more hull, which is not insignificant, but it does seem like a pretty big points gap for an otherwise comparable pair of pilots. However, we do have to address the fact that you don't get to fly Sun Tefel on the Scum Faction. Fen Rao is very, very unique on the Faction. Initiative 6 alone is a very potent thing, which Scum really gets access to. And to have it on an ace platform is very cool. Also, Guru without Maneuver, it's simple. I love this build. I've flown it myself. It feels really legitimate. Um, 68 points, same as Fen Rao. Um, I'd actually situationally rate this above Fen Rao. I really like Outmaneuver on the Star Upper with those curved barrel rolls. It's surprising easy to trigger, especially if you come at your opponent with both aces on either side. Makes it very difficult for your opponent to choose which ace to face. Um, yeah, really, really powerful. I think we're going to see a lot more of Guri in the meta, but more about her in later videos. Payload Goldali, as I said before, the platform, the Hawk has had a very nice push power level, um, jam, boost, all that kind of stuff. Paylob's ability is as relevant as it always was. He's more expensive than other Hawk pilots now. That doesn't matter. It's still very legitimate. And the fact that he has Boba Fett's interesting. Um, look, I don't think Boba Fett really has any value in this list. He was required for this tournament again. But it is additional upside, just in case you want to place Balob in the middle of the board for some reason. I don't know. I guess if your opponent sort of deploys everything in one corner and he's the highest initiative, which is unlikely, you could put him in the opposite side and sort of come at your opponent with your aces like that. Not that likely, but it is additional upside if you want to take it. Look, overall, I think we're expecting to see this list flown without Boba Fett. And without Boba Fett, it's 189 points. There is an 11-point bid in this list. And I think that almost justifies putting something like Fearless on Fen Rao. Definitely worth playing around with that. I don't think it's required, but something definitely to think about. All right, on to the top four. And the one Rebel list to make it into the top eight had Wedge, Dutch, and Garvin Drays. As I said before, a lot of other lists had Luke. Her Wedge and Luke seems pretty interchangeable, apart from the fact that Luke's more expensive. I get the impression that Wedge is the pilot you take when you want something like Luke but can't quite afford him. And that's fine. Wedge is still pretty legitimate. And the fact that he's Initiative 6, I think, is actually very relevant, especially with other lists flying Luke, uh, Inquisitor, Whisper, all that kind of stuff, and enemy Initiative 6 like uh, Vader, Fen Rao, and Sun Tefel. There's a lot of things that makes Wedge's initiative six very very relevant and if you have a decent bid alongside him 
He can blank out opponent's aces, which is just very good. Plus he gets rid of their green dice, which again is good against aces. Also the fact that he can still get rid of green dice against zero agility ships, I think is great for this platform. I really like Wedge moving forward. I think he's costed very competitively and I look forward to see what he can do in the meta. Also Dutch and Garvin's interesting. Now we were able to get Leia in this list, obviously because she was free. Um, if Leia wasn't in this list, it would still be 200 points exactly. And I like it alongside X-Wings. I think that's definitely something worth talking about. Now, the ARC-170 and Y-Wings, yes, they obviously have a bit of red on their dial. But alongside X-Wings, Leia Organa lets you Talon roll as a white maneuver. And that is very interesting. Very keen to see whether we can get sort of like a B and an X build with Leia Organa. But obviously, that's not what this is about. Again, I just get the impression that Leia is put into this list because she had to. But there is a little bit of upside that we can get out of her. I definitely think that talent role turning white would have been relevant in some matches. Also, a cool thing here, we have Dutch Vanda uh, handing out target locks to buddies. And all three of these platforms had proton torpedoes. Proton Torpedoes just looks so good in the early meta of 2nd edition. Even at 9 points, this just seems to be so, so powerful. The ability to use this twice with target locks, um, converting results for free, definitely something to look out for. A highly coveted piece of ordnance for sure. Moving on, we have yet another Imperial Alpha Strike list. This time we're favoring unnamed pilots, and we meant we got another platform onto the playing field. Which is interesting, because we got Colonel Jendon on the Lambda Class Shuttle. Now, I don't usually rate the abilities of pilots in the Lambda Class Shuttle that highly. I think Jendon is useful upside when also carrying an important crew member like Palp or Vader. However, along an Alpha Strike list, it's interesting. 46 points seems like a lot to invest in this. However, the Lambda Class Shuttle can now coordinate and jam and it's got a rear shot, so maybe it is good enough to field without a crew member. Interesting. Also, it means in the opening round, you can get target locks on all of your Punishers and Bombers. Fantastic. In the case of this list, we have four Bombers. Three of them have Proton Torpedoes. And Major Rama has Cluster Missiles. And I like the fact that we put Cluster Missiles on the highest initiative ship. I think they're the most difficult to work with. Definitely not as sort of high consistent upside as Proton Torpedoes. But when you put it on the higher initiative ship, it means you're able to line up those shots better, get the double tapping cluster missiles working more often. Also, I will give credit to this player more than anyone else because they used Ruthless on three different platforms and they built a list around Ruthless. Most of the top 16 lists did not build lists around the cards they were required to fly, so that's really cool. Um, again, it just looks like a very basic down-the-line Imperial Alpha Strike list that's firing on all cylinders. I love the inclusion of Gen and I'll be curious to see whether this happens in other lists. The idea of having a Lambda class shuttle just for the pilot ability is so bizarre and unique and new. And I just want to see if that takes off. And giving all the ships a quasi long range scanners in second edition might just be enough relevant upside. Okay, moving on to the top two. The runner up list, we had Redline, Whisper and Major Vermeil. Redline had Trajectory Simulator, Proton Torpedoes, Proton Bomb, Seismic Charges and Ablative Plating. Whisper has Duke and Collision Detector, and Major Vermeil has Vader, Triple Zero, and Ruthless. Um, just on Vermeil first, Vader and Triple Zero. Now, Triple Zero, I've really struggled to make this card work in my own list building. I see it come up a lot in lists. I think newer players in particular are very excited about this card. I do find the restriction of having to get into range one of ships to be very problematic with this card. However, to be fair, yes, we do have the upside of being able to also jam ships when you get into range one. So you could make the argument that this ship already wants to do that. So it's kind of playing into the ship's natural way of flying anyway. Vader means you can also dump out a bit of extra damage, which is a lot of fun. You can also do a bit of coordinating, which is also fun. Um, but ultimately what I think this list boils down to is that support ship alongside Redline and Whisper. Just talking about Whisper quickly. Yes, we have the basically stable on Duke, but Collision Detector I think is a very interesting include. It takes Whisper from 56 points to 61, so not completely desirable points wise. I think 56 is often way more competitive and it would increase the bid on this by five points, which is not irrelevant when you have Whisper. However, Collision Detector has an amazing amount of upside. I've personally played around with it on Curry 
and when you can get it off, when you can basically fly through a rock and get these impossible shots, um, that always feels really good. And with Whisper, there's also the additional upside of decloaking through a rock. Um, I think collision detect is something to look out for because you get to use it after you see where you move. It sort of works with a lot of information. It unlocks the way your ship flies. It feels very responsive, very adaptive. It's a fun card to play with. I just do worry that for tournament play, it's a bit spiky. But at the very least, we saw it in the top two of a relatively major tournament, so... Cool. And yeah, Redline. Redline is Redline. Firing on all cylinders. Seismic, Proton, and Trajectory Simulator gives you the most amount of flexibility in terms of dropping bombs. Sure, your opponent gets all the information. They fly, boost, barrel roll, slam, whatever after you drop your bombs. It doesn't matter. You have so much board control with this, and that feels really good. Plus, Proton Torpedoes. The fact that we can get this on the table for 68 points feels really, really good. Um, that feels so competitively costed for something that can just dump out so much damage in so many different ways. Uh, in fact, while we're talking about Redline, let's just move on to the winning list. It also had Redline alongside Sunterfell and Vader. This version of Redline had Trajectory Simulator, Proton Torpedoes, and Proton Bombs. Look, I really don't think the loss of seismic charges or ablative plating really hurts this too much. Being able to dump more points into Vader feels absolutely fine. Again, we're talking supernatural reflexes. Fire control system, just good down the line upgrades that give you the most flexibility when you fly at initiative six. Um, Vader can use all his force tokens and reposition absolutely perfectly every time. Sure, he has to hurt himself when he boosts. It doesn't really seem to matter. Overall, flexibility when you activate initiative six seems to be such a potent thing. Also, soon to fell. Again, we have the prerequisite Ruthless here, and I don't think it does much here. You get the upside of maybe dumping on some extra damage when your opponent ship manages to fly next to Redline. Maybe Vader in a very clutch situation when you just have to get that extra point of damage across, but it's not likely to happen. Ultimately, what this is, is just showing that we had to get Ruthless in here somewhere, and that's where they chose to put it. What I think is most interesting about this list is it only runs a two-point bid. Um, if we count Ruthless, it's a one-point bid. Um, but as I was saying, I don't think it really is that impactful. So even if we cut it away and treat it as the list that the player would probably want to build, we're talking a two-point bid with two initiative six pilots. That seems very, very ambitious. Um, but... It won, so you can't complain too much. I was going to say, we're seeing a lot of 10-point bids amongst all these top eight lists, but it's a bit hard to call 10 points as the go-to initiative bid when the list that won ran a two-point bid. So, I don't know. I get this question quite a lot. In fact, I've been talking a lot with the patrons on the Discord server over the past couple of weeks. The question constantly comes up, what do you think we need to run as a bid? And my answer to that is, well, we need a meta. And while this tournament does give us a bit of an indication of what the meta might look like in a few ways, there is a few caveats. The fact that we had to fly with these particular cards, the fact that there were no Boba Fett pilots in this tournament does kind of weigh on that. It's not really that reliable information. Um, it would seem to be with a little asterisk, maybe about 10 points if you want to run a serious dedicated ace list, a, a two or three ship build with aces. But I don't know. It's a very hard question to answer. And I'm hoping when we get a few more tournament results rolling in, we are able to answer that question a bit more. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Just a quick apology. I know usually with these meta videos, I talk about stats and we have charts and everything. Because of the nature of the Kurasan Invitational, I just wanted to make this a bit more conversational and open-ended. We don't really have good hard data on the meta right now. But this, I think, does give us a few early indications, especially of the pilots that were chosen. I think more than anything out of the Coruscant Invitational, we have a good indication of like roughly like the top five pilots of every faction. This seems to be at least a good indication of that. Anyway, guys, in the meantime, like and subscribe. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter and Reddit. Please consider supporting the Patreon. Thank you so much to my existing patrons for both supporting the channel and helping me out on the Discord server, having a chat about this kind of stuff. The conversation is certainly very interesting in the early days of the X-Wing 2nd Edition meta. I will catch you guys in the next video.